Assalamu alaikum, welcome to session two of part four. Um, this section um, covers low level concerns. So it's about allegations that do not meet the harm threshold. Um, so this includes low level concerns um, and making a link between low level con concerns, staff code of conduct, safeguarding policies, and recording and sharing information uh, with relevant parties, including whether this information should be included in references or not. So the term low level concern does not mean that it's not important, it's not, it's insignificant. It means that the behavior towards the child does not meet the harm threshold and the harm threshold as listed below, we've discussed in session one, um, so, you know, the, the individual hasn't behaved in a way that has indicated a risk of harm, immediate risk of harm to the child, um, etc. like we discussed in session one. So what does constitute as low level concern? So a low level concern is any concern, no matter how small, um, but makes the child feel at unease or there's a nagging doubt that an adult working with a child um, in school may have acted um, in a way that is against the staff code of conduct and that includes inappropriate conduct outside of work. So that would include any behavior outside of work that would work again, that would go against the staff code of conduct or um, does not meet the threshold to consider a referral to LADO. So it's not as, um, it's not as serious um, to make a referral to um, Lado. However, it's still concerning. There's still a concern there. So some examples of low level um, concern. Uh, I'll just say, Khadija, before we, we start on this, I think it's really important that, brothers and sisters, that you have understood what a low level concern is from the first few slides that have been shared um, today. It really is important for you to know that this is a, a very important part of the Keeping Children Safe um, updated guidance, you need to pay real attention to what is being shared here. And that in many of our schools, a lot of what we're going to share now um, does happen. But now it's about what you're going to do as a school about it. And that's really important. Um, so Khadija, if you share some of those examples um, for our colleagues and um, they will have well, a great, a better understanding. Okay, so being overly friendly with children. Now, I think it's very, very important that, um, you know, schools determine a difference between being overly friendly and being, going down to a child's level of understanding with them. Now, there is a big, big difference. Being overly friendly um, would mean that, you know, you discuss your own personal issues with children. Um, which obviously you're cross crossing the boundaries there. So you need to stay within your professional boundaries at all times. Um, I think, having, sorry, sorry Khadija there, just okay. to cut you, but I think it's really important that when you are holding your staff training day on the, the revisions to the Keeping Children Safe document, that you are absolutely clear with your staff about what this means. That first bullet point is, is, has been included we, this is something that's come from the guidance document. Um, they've given you very clear examples of what, of what is believed to be low level concern behavior. And as Khadija mentioned just there, sharing personal stories um, with um, your pupils to a point that it would be classed as being over friendly. So we can talk about, well, we took the dog for a walk. You know, that's that's something that, that you do as, as part of exercise or it's, could be used to illustrate a point or um, you know getting some fresh air or whatever it is that you're trying to to share with pupils but actually how far do we take that and that's really important that you as a school um, are able to 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 be clear in your in your staff handbooks in your code of conduct and in at which point do you believe as a school that it becomes over friendly so I think that's really really important and and for me, one of the biggest changes that has come into this um, document and, and something that you really need to spend some time on with senior staff, with your staff when you come to share with them the changes um, and that your, your documentation as a school 
is absolutely clear about what you want to um, define as being over friendly. Um, and I think, as I said there, can you just give an excellent example? Um, also having favorites now, unfortunately, you know, these things do happen. So many pupils are made to feel that a particular teacher or a particular group of teachers Um, show preference to what a group of people or one people in particular over another and I think no we've people at any point should be made to feel yeah we've heard that so many times haven't we Khadija where yeah. you know in schools pupils may say um yeah but that teacher has got a particular group in her class or in our class that always gets the attention that is what is now classified as having favorites and and inspectors will speak to children they will ask them well you know in your classes, are there particular groups of children that perhaps get greater attention? Um, are they the same groups, groups of children that are rewarded? And this is something that you again need to be very clear about in your school and your expectations about not making pupils feel that teachers have particular favorites or that if a child is doing particularly well um, all the time that they are getting the attention. And that's something, again, that I would um, urge you to, to give your time and attention to. Yeah. Um, taking photographs on, of children on their phone. Again, you know, this is something that should not happen at all. Um, taking photographs of pupils, that should, that should only be done on a school device, so a school camera. Um, but at no point should photographs of pupils be taken on your personal mobile phones um, and obviously now that was not acceptable anyway but now it actually is would be recorded as a low-level concern. Um, uh, I think that's the most important thing Khadija isn't it that now as a school you would be expected to record it yeah and um, and I think that that's the difference here so if pupils are spoken to about things that are happening in school and they will happen um, but it's actually as a school what you're doing about it. Now, inspectors may have conversations with pupils and may come back to senior leaders and said, some of your children have said that there have been times when photographs have been taken of children on a mobile phone because we were on a trip and the camera stopped working. And because that has happened, inspectors will want to see now the record of that particular incident because that has now been disclosed. That actually, yes, it does happen, and it did happen, and and sometimes staff will make an error of judgment or 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 whatever, but actually, as a school, you now have a procedure to follow, and numerous times actually have schools been um, uh, questioned about ineffective recording. This now has added to that recording responsibility, and so this is really important. Um, uh, for us to ensure that we are clear. Um, in fact, Khadija has been working uh, very hard on writing a new low level concern policy for, for our schools, uh, because we need to ensure that our staff are absolutely certain about what that means for us as a school, what is expected of them, what is not expected of them, and what would happen next in the event of, um, of, of things happening that shouldn't. So again, it's really important that if you come to be made aware that um, a member of staff has been over friendly or photographs have been taken of children on a phone that now needs to be recorded because if children are to disclose that to inspectors inspectors will ask to see those records and anything actually that would fit into now what we've got here on the slide are just some examples this is not an exhausted list um, so you've got to be aware that there may be times when particular things shared by pupils or even staff there, there will be staff that perhaps might share particular concerns with inspectors, which would be defined as a low level concern and inspectors will come back to leaders and ask for information um, about that. So it's really important that you are building this into your staff training day, that you've got clear guidance and procedures about it. Um, and, and as I've said already, it's one of the most important changes for me in this in this document. Engaging with pupils on a one-to-one -one basis in a secluded area, so where there's nobody, there's no other pupils, there's no members of staff. You're in an area where 
you know, nobody can really see you, um, that would be inappropriate, that would not be acceptable now. Or behind closed doors where there's no glass panelling in a door. If there's a glass panel within a door and you're, you know, you're doing some intervention with the pupil or the pupil has asked to stay back and speak to you, there's nothing wrong with that because there's a glass panel there and people passing are able to look into the room, that is fine. But if it's a door where there's no glass panel um, and nobody can see beyond that door and that door is closed, it would be it would not be appropriate for you to be alone with that child. Um, using inappropriate, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Khadija. I think the secluded area um, is something that, again, we need to pay particular attention to. So working with a child, intervention might be taking place in primary schools, we may be listening to children read, all sorts of reasons why a member of staff may be working with a child on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and often schools, um, naively think that if I'm working in a classroom with a closed door, then that would be classed as an area that, that wouldn't be acceptable. But actually working in an area that, that in which there, are no, there is no um, uh, traffic, there is nobody passing through, and therefore it wouldn't be easy to, to, to see someone as you would do if you were passing by a, a busy corridor, would be classed as a secluded area. Um, so, you know, again, children being questioned about this, may be asked actually, you know, when you have intervention sessions, where, do, where does it happen? And if children want to say, well, sometimes it happens in the corridor on the first floor in the corner, and actually that might be taken as a cause for concern and therefore followed up um, by inspectors as they would do if they were concerned about anything that pupils or staff shared. And so it's really important that again, during your training day, you are absolutely making it clear uh, to members of staff that may be working one-to-one -one with children, that these areas of the school can never be used. Um, and if you are going to do some intervention work, these are the areas that can be used only for work to work with children on a one-to-one -one basis. Be, senior leaders, be absolutely clear to your staff about the expectations that you have um, on them. And I think there are times as well where um, it, a member of staff might not follow through on guidance and procedure and it comes to light. But inspectors will recognize that you as a school have done everything possible, including providing clear written documentation to your staff, including um, addressing it at uh, staff training days, which is again, minuted, or you've got PowerPoint presentations to illustrate that you've been very clear about the expectations of, on staff. You might include this in your staff handbooks, for example, and all of these, all these um, steps that you take as a school will be supportive of you and the work that you have done to ensure a safeguarding culture in your school, even if a member of staff was to not follow the rules. And it's the same with risk assessments. You do your best to safeguard children, to safeguard staff, but sometimes things happen, but you've done everything that was possible. And that's what they're looking for. So again, just really important on that point there. And, um, I think the last point Khadija will um, will go through in some detail with you but again there is there are some there's some text there that really needs close attention and evaluation of your school and what it is that may be happening that needs to be addressed uh, Khadija thank you yeah. so um, using inappropriate sexualized, intimidating or offensive language with pupils. So I think, again, like Sina said, we need to be very, very cautious of how we come across and how we behave with uh, children, because any anything that's going to make a child feel uncomfortable um, will now be classed as low level concern. Um, and it is upon the school to ensure that that is recorded. Um, should uh, because it says intimidating here i'm just going to add in uh, one thing and hasina might like to add uh, shed some light onto that as well that when we are when you know people do misbehave that's normal um but when we we're addressing their misbehavior i think we need to be very very careful on how we how we speak to the children. Um, I think a lot of a lot of times um, staff can come down very, very hard and really raise their voice to the extent that it does become intimidating for others around, let alone the child himself or herself. Therefore, I think you need to be very, very cautious of how you address that misbehavior and how you are speaking to the pupil. Sina, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, Khadija, absolutely. I think you're, you know, you've 
spot on really with what you said there. I think that um, this, this will relate to your behavior policy. And so we already have shared uh, in the videos that we've done so far, the recordings that we've done so far, that your behavior policy will need review as part of the changes that have come into keeping children safe, setting clear expectations of how um, low level disruption or poor behavior is managed in your school. And this now falls within that. So how are we addressing? How do we make children feel? Um, and actually, intimidation is something that, that can come very easily. Um, you know, teachers are in a position of power. And, and, and sometimes, sadly, that, that power is, is, is abused. And so it's, it's important that you are, you are clear about the way that children are um, uh, addressed, that your expectations as a school um, and, and I've, in my, in my time in, in the profession, countless, countless times have children come back and said to me, you know, but the teacher said this or spoke to me with this, with this word. Um, and that sort of thing. Now in my school, I would record, formally record, because that's the expectation upon me um, uh, because of the children, uh, keeping children safe guidance. So again, absolutely be clear about the way staff should be talking to children, addressing children when there are particular issues or low level behavior or poor behavior, um, offensive language. Um, again, it, in a school where we have a diverse population, it can be very easy to, to use certain language or to behave in a certain manner, which is offensive to a member of another community in, in that particular classroom. And so again, it's really important that you are setting clear guidelines um, and use these bullet points, uh, brothers and sisters, because this is from the document um, and you can share it as it is and say to your staff, this is what we are told. This is what we must now do. And we must ensure that we do not um, you know, that we do not cross um, any of these. So I think it's, it's important that if you've got particular members of staff that you are concerned about, then what training and development is needed there? What support is needed there? Because throughout the time that we've been recording these um, sessions, we've talked about staff development on all sorts of levels. And this is part of that. This should be part of your action plan. This should be part of your preparation um, in addressing the, those changes, being aware of the needs of particular members of staff. Teachers and um, colleagues are at, at different stages in their, in their career. What support do they need? Do they need mentoring or coaching? Do they need to attend particular um, CPD days? Do they need to observe colleagues in a way that they address um, children's um, uh, behavior? So it's that all of that needs fine attention. And, and it's something that I would ask you and urge you to reflect over um, on, on the completion of this, of this session. Thank you, Khadija. Um, I've just expanded a bit more on one of the bullet points about taking photos of children on there, um, on your phones. Again, like whether that's on school site or off school site, you need to ensure you use a school camera or a school device at all times. Um, again, having favourites, you know, all pupils should be made to made that they are treated equally. And like Asina mentioned, um, Ofsted will have conversations with uh, pupils, and you know, pupils, pupils, you know, if they're if they're going to be honest and they have been made to feel like that, they will share that. So at all times, pupils should be made that they are all made to feel that they are all being treated equally at all times. So sharing low level concerns. So low level concerns about a member of staff should be reported to the DSL or the deputy DSL. If the low level concern is about the DSL, it should then be reported to the head teacher. So um, all reports of low level concerns go to the DSL and if the DSL is not on site, then it's the deputy DSL. However, if the low level concern is about the DSL, then it would be reported to the head teacher. Now, how, um, I mean, I'm just going to add here um, that I think schools now need to have um, a procedure of how reports would be um, reported. So you would need to have a rep reporting form um, of how you're going to report these concerns, so low level concern reporting form. Um, as, as you would do, isn't it, Khadija, with any, any welfare because concerns? Because that would or... be then your, your evidence and everything would be documented. 
yeah 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah i think it's it's you know very clear can we just go back to that yeah. that slide I, I just want to to remind our you know our listeners that right at the beginning when we started the recording of part one we talked about the musts and the shoulds and um although here in the guidance we are told that a member of staff that low level concerns about members that should be reported to the DSL or deputy. Um, first of all, that means you need to um, make sure it is recorded or reported. There should be, unless there are good reasons why it shouldn't be. So remember the difference between must and should. Um, but actually, going back to all that we've said so far, how do I know that I need to report this? And, that, and I think that will also need some thought. But as a school, how are you going to make this clear? That there is now a process for reporting and that you need to take it to the DSL or to their deputy. Um, and if the concern is about the DSL, then it should be taken to the head. How are you going to make sure that's clear? Because I wouldn't know otherwise unless you told me. So again, you need to be clear about how are you going to share this? Um, and as I mentioned to you today, um, uh, earlier on, Khadija has been working quite hard on our own procedures um, for doing so. So it's something that you need to, to be thinking about and to make, you know, to make pupils aware that if they are worried about anything in particular, then they should be able to raise those concerns uh, with you. Um, so I think that's just important to add there. Um, it's saying that schools must ensure that you create an environment where staff are encouraged and feel confident to self-refer. So um, I think we need to create a culture in our schools where staff, if they have made a mistake, or they have behaved in a way which goes against the school code of conduct or falls within low level concerns then they are confident to come forward and report that to the DSL or the head teacher themselves, um, but also create a culture where other staff, where they witness this kind of low level concern um, from another member of staff, they report it to the appropriate people themselves as well. Yeah, and I think this is where I've said that, the, that you've got to make sure that that's clear. And, and it actually in here, it says schools must. So that's not an option. That's, that's, that's a given. That's something that you absolutely must do where you are going to make clear to your staff that where you see this type of behaviour, um, we're not here. I know that some colleagues will have very good relationships with each other within the school setting, but it really is about making sure because at the end of, at the end of all of this, it is the child that is the ultimate concern and they are central to all the decisions that we make. They are the most important people in our school. And so it's really important that you create that atmosphere. We've talked about creating a, this safeguarding culture. We've always talked about it, but I hope that you've been able to see that this is very different to what we've seen before. And, and of course, that comes back from a, a number of you know, research pieces that have been done, particularly um, one from Ofsted. And, and so it's important that you are creating that environment and that you can document that you have been created and evidence that you've been creating an environment where staff are encouraged and they feel confident um, that if they go to a member of staff to report that pupils are taking, the staff are taking pictures of children on their mobile phone, that something will be done about it. Um, because inspectors will speak to staff about this and they will ask them the questions that has your school created an environment where you are able to share concerns um, that are low level? And can you demonstrate and illustrate that point to us of how that's been done? And who do you go to? And what are the procedures? And if, if staff are not able to be um, fluent in their response, then Ofsted will, will, will realise that the school hasn't done enough to create that environment that it clearly states must be created. So really important, again, that this is factored into the documentation that you are going to prepare, the training that you're going to deliver to your staff, um, in preparation for your September start. Thank you, Khadija. Where a low level concern relates to a person employed by a supply agency or a contractor that works in school, 
then that concern should be shared with the DSL and or the head teacher. So in this case, where it's about a um, member of staff who's coming from a supply agency or it's a contractor working in the school and the concern is relating to them, then the DSL and the dep um, sorry and the head teacher should be informed. Um, and the um, sorry, the concern should be recorded and shared with the employer. So if if it's about a uh, member of staff from a supply agency, then the agency should be informed as well, um, because they can then have a record of inappropriate behaviours and they can see whether there's and what needs to be done further, whether you know whether there are further risks um, from that member of staff's behaviour. So that's what it would enable the agency to identify further risks. And that is why it's important that whether it's um, a, a member of staff who's supplied by a supply agency or uh, a contractor, those concerns are still shared. They may not be internal staff, but they the concerns still need to be shared with the DSL or the head teacher. So relevant measures can be taken. I think quite a lot of that was was revised in last year's Keeping Children Safe document about anyone that comes into school um, mm -hmm. and works for the school but is not employed um, um, on a on a full time basis or a or a permanent basis. And so there were some changes to the guidance last year, and this obviously um, stresses further that anyone who comes into your school setting that works with your children for whom you have a concern about either from the list that we've shared, so they've taken pictures on their mobile phone, or they have um, been intimidating when there's been a, a concern about behavior, or um, they've acted in a particular way that would cause you worry, that then needs to be recorded in exactly the same way. But it goes further that when, uh, for example, you are working with a sporting uh, agency. Uh, quite a number of schools do. Um, it's contracted out to um, uh, some, some sports um, companies and if you had a concern about a member of staff's behaviour that works in your school then you would need to report it to them but of course you would keep records of all of this because that would be asked um, for review as part of um, the inspection process. So it's really important that you are keeping that information, you are learning lessons from the information that you are recording and that you are able to make changes um, to ensure that children are safeguarded um, at all times. So all low level concerns should be recorded in writing by the DSL or the deputy. Um, the, records, the record should include details of the concern, the context in which the concern arose, action that was taken and the name of the individual sharing the concern um, if the con uh, individual sharing the concern wishes to remain anonymous then that should be respected as reasonably possible but those are the details that the dsl must record again i think it might be worth as well khadija that staff are including the uh, um, leaders are including this in their safeguarding policy under this under the job description of um, uh, the DSLs, because this is now new uh, to their role and, and therefore um, should be made clear. The DSL should certainly know that this is part of their responsibility um, and how that recording should take place. Yeah. Okay, so what should schools do with the records of low level concerns? So the school can decide where these records are kept, but they have to be kept confidential um, and held securely and comply with the GDPR Act. Um, records should be reviewed so that potential patterns of concerning, problematic or inappropriate behaviour can be identified. So the same way there is a need for you to report low level concerns to external agency whose staff um, are contracted to work with yourselves. Um, the same way you would need to review um, patterns of concerning behaviour from uh, for internal staff as well, because you need to identify whether there is a pattern of inappropriate behaviour and what you need to do further. Where a pattern of such behaviour is identified, the school should decide on a course of action, either through its disciplinary procedures or where a pattern of behaviour moves from a concern to meeting the harm threshold, it should be referred to the LADO. So again, looking at when 
um, reports of low level concerns about particular member of staff. There have been quite a few con low level concerns concerns reported, you need to review and decide on a course of action. So will um, internal disciplinary procedures be enough? Or do these low level, con you know, these consistent low level procedures, are they enough for now to contact the LADO and make a referral to the LADO? So that's what, um, you know, reviewing would enable the schools to do for management to do is to be identify uh, where these patterns are going and what actions need to be taken. Consideration should also be given to whether the wider cultural issues within the school that enable the behaviour to occur and where appropriate policies could be revised or extra training delivered to minimise the risk of it happening again. So again, reviewing these low level concern reports, um, you know, it will make you question whether there's a culture in school. Um, that needs to, you know, that needs to be addressed um, that because, you know, this kind of behaviour is becoming the norm within staff or whether you need to change your policies, adapt your policies and procedure, or deliver extra training to staff to minimise further risks. Yeah, I think um, it's really important that you um, give this some thought because we're so busy in our schools and there's so much to do all the time. Um, and it's not been easy of, for, for all of us over the last 18 months, but certainly, to take time to reflect and review our practices, to be able to see what's happening in our schools, to be able to see, um, and you would do this, or I would hope you would do this with attendance, for example. So if you see a pattern of, of absence, how are you managing it? How are you going to address it? What action have you taken to improve? And, and in the same way, if you were to see that there is a pattern um, occurring you know, within the school, and it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, numerous cases before you make that judgment but but just enough for you to say okay there are things happening in our school setting that we're really not happy about these are things that we now need to address as a school and what is it that we're going to do about them and then to be able to demonstrate that you've taken action to improve um, because when we talk about a safeguarding culture uh, we're talking not just about having policies and procedures in place to keep children safe but it's about reflecting and reviewing and strengthening procedures to say right we're going to make sure that those things don't happen again because we're going to do this this and this or we're going to take this action or that or whatever it is so it's really important that you can demonstrate that you are a school that is constantly seeking to improve and that you are reviewing uh, what's happening in your school and then you are making a judgment to improve as a result of that um, so this again very clear because schools often um, will have recorded incidences of poor attendance or poor behavior but actually what they haven't done and many schools will have uh, this written in their report um, for those that don't well what lessons have been learned what has the school done to improve their processes um, so I think that, um, you know, we, I can give you an example, actually, there was a school where one of the playing areas that were used by pupils was, there was a lot of gravel. And gravel meant that children fell at playtime or lunchtime and, and, and got hurt. So when reviewing the, the school's recording of accidents at lunchtime, inspectors noted a pattern they noted that quite a high number of incidences were happening in that gravel area and children were getting hurt. What, however, they went on to do was ask senior leaders, what is it that you've done about this to improve the surface uh, on which children play? And the school had not done enough. And in fact, that was a, a standard failure for that school. So it's really important that you are able to calendar in times in your academic year where you are reviewing that practice, uh, not just this practice, but all safeguarding practices within your school, ensuring that they are effective, taking lessons from them and moving forward so that your school is on this continuous journey of improvement and that you are demonstrating with, beyond any reasonable doubt that your school is absolutely clear about its safeguarding priorities and that children and staff are at the center of that um, so 
just something so important here for you to to build into the work that you're going to do um, uh, after uh, you've had a chance to to reflect on the changes um, in the revised guidance. Right. It is up to the schools to decide how long they retain such records, but it is recommended that um, the records on um, low level concerns per individual um, are retained until they leave their employment at the school. So um, that, that would be the best practice it is recommended that the records are retained until the individual leaves this, um, their employment at the school. So responding to low-level concerns, the school should set out clear procedures for responding to reports of low-level concerns. If the concern has been raised by a third party, the DSL should collect as much evidence as, pos as possible by speaking directly to the person sharing the concern unless it has been raised anonymously to the in individual involved and any witnesses. So like you would do for allegations that meet the harm threshold, you'd need to make just as much, um, you'd need to gather just as much evidence um, for low level concerns as well. So you need to ensure that you've got the, you know, you've got the correct um, information. You speak to the person directly, unless obviously it was uh, raised anonymously um, and you speak to any witnesses or the individual involved as well. So what do you need to do now? Um, schools need to have a good low level concern policy, policy, which will simply be a reflection and extension of the school staff code of conduct and procedures to follow. So schools should all have a staff code of conduct. Um, the low level concern policy will just be an extension to that. So you will be adding to the school staff code of conduct. Um, but I would recommend that all schools have um, a separate low level concern policy, um, but they update their current staff code of conduct to reflect um, the low level concerns, but I have a separate low level concern policy just to um, just to make it very, very clear for staff um, on what the expectations of their behaviour is. Ensure Khadija, you I mean, I, Khadija, sorry, I think a, a moment in that in this particular slide, you, you did cut out there, but I think that the message um, is clear that it's important that you are adding this I mean, we've talked about it already that you're very clear about the expectations and staff so that's something that you will need to do and um and again as, as it's written on the bottom of the slide there to to make changes as you review your practice um so if things are not working what needs to happen now and therefore what changes will you make to your documentation because of that yeah. Um, ensure you deliver staff training um, and like Asina said previously um, that staff training is crucial for low level concern um, as for all safeguarding at this current moment because there's been so many changes but um, for the allegations and the low level concern um, have a particular slot dedicated to just that for staff training and make it very clear what your expectations are as a school and what procedures um, and policies are uh, for low level concerns and allegations. Um, I have provided a link at the bottom um, because there's detailed guidance and case studies on low level concerns um, on that particular website. Um, so what should be included in a low level concern? So making it clear, what do we mean by a low level concern in our school setting? And what is it that we don't want to see happen? Um, and of course, how if you've got concerns as a member of staff, how you are going to share those level concerns and the procedures to follow. Um, and of course, as, as we've mentioned quite a number of times already, it really is about embedding this culture of um, uh, expectation amongst your staff and what it is that you want to see happen. Um, earlier on, we talked about a, a code of conduct and this it should already be in your school. This is now about strengthening that code of conduct. Um, so it's just important that, that that is part of your low level concern policy. It's a recommendation. We're not saying that you need to have one. You could add it to other existing documentation on staff code of conduct, but it's something that will demonstrate that you that you've understood 
um, what is required of you as a school now because of those changes and your expectations on staff. But that can come in a number of ways. This is just something that we would say should be included in low level concern policy or certainly added to any existing, existing documentation. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide there, Khadija. Um, and of course, as we've mentioned already, it, be, it is a responsibility of governing bodies and proprietors to ensure that the guidance that you share, the expectations that you have are absolutely adhered to and implemented effectively. So governors and proprietors, trustees, if you're listening to um, these recorded sessions, it's your responsibility to check that that's happening. So to ask the question, what type of um, uh, records do we currently hold? What referrals have we currently had? How have we dealt with that? And that's really um, part of what should be um, uh, responsibility from our governors, trustees or uh, proprietors. And as it says at the end of that paragraph, to ensure that appropriate action is taken in a timely manner, just like everything else that we have discussed, how quickly are you addressing and managing those referrals? And what is it that you're doing about it? And I think it's about safeguarding children, making children feel um, at ease within your school setting. So if, if they are being intimidated by a member of staff in every lesson that they are attending, if you're moving quickly to address those, um, those concerns, then it's been done in a timely manner and you are working quickly to safeguard uh, children and deal with any concerns. And, and I, as, as governors and trustees and proprietors, you would expect to see that. So you would ask the story, when did we get this referral? How was it dealt with? How, how quickly did we deal with it? And, and where are we at with it now? And those are the sorts of questions um, that, that you really should be able to answer. Um, but also to know that there is a much greater responsibility upon governors, upon trustees and proprietors in the revised guidance. So if you're not clear about what those expectations are, it's really important that you are speaking to senior leaders in your school or um, listening in on the videos that we've done or, or any other um, uh, material that's now been made available because of the, the changes um, and, and making yourself um, aware of what those changes are. Who can achieve the purpose of their low level concern policy by, for example, ensuring the staff are clear about um, what appropriate behaviour is and are confident in distinguishing expected and appropriate behaviour from concerning problematic or inappropriate behaviour in themselves and others. So staff are confident that they are, they know what is expected, what kind of behaviour is expected of themselves and of others and what um, what behaviour would be would be classed as inappropriate about themselves as well as well as others? Empowering staff to share any low level safeguarding concerns. So yeah, to make staff feel you know empowered and comfortable and confident enough to come and report any low level concerns that they may have about others or even about themselves. Like I said previously that there should be a culture where um, staff are able to confidently come and self-refer if they feel that they behaved in a way which may have been inappropriate. Addressing unprofessional behavior and supporting the individual to correct it at an early stage. So to address that un unprofessional behavior, but at the same time, providing support to the individual to kind of put that behavior right. So to you know, to sit down and to have a conversation to kind of work out what you can do as a school to support that member of staff, to give them pointers, to give them advice and guidance on how they can correct their behaviour with pupils. Providing a responsive, sensitive and proportionate handling of such concerns when they are raised. So again, you know, um, to ensure that each case of low level concern when it is raised to ensure that you deal with it um, in a very sensitive um, manner and that you know staff feel confident enough that yes if we were if i had to report another concern i'd do that um, without any hesitation because i know it was handled and it was managed very well helping identify any weakness in the school's safeguarding systems 
Um, so again, you know, this will help you identify where um, safeguarding structures and systems need to uh, need to be worked on and what further um, areas you need to work on. Okay, I think that's, um, uh, can you just brought it, that's brought us to the end of, of part four. Obviously, colleagues, there's quite a lot to take in and to think and reflect on um, really is about looking at your school and current practices. And I would say to you that take the time to work with colleagues to, to do that. Um, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll be back soon with our final part of the changes. Um, they are going to be quite lengthy sessions. Uh, we have quite a lot to cover. Um, and so hopefully, inshallah, that again will provide you with some really deep, in-depth understanding of, of the new guidance on this. Um, and, and, and hopefully, inshallah, that will be helpful to you. So jazakallah for listening and uh, we'll see you again in part five.